just a scene from hell here. All the vehicles on fire. Modern warfare comes live and direct from the world's battlefields into our homes. This is going to be a big bang. Today's war correspondents have an armory of broadcast technology that travels with them into the field. They've been developing the tools of their trade since their profession was born. Okay, you may move. Thank you. And they've brought us the drama and the action. The courage of the people, the flash and roar of the guns rolling down the streets. And they've competed to send news from the combat zone ahead of their rivals. The sky over Baghdad is black. Come this way, Khan. This is the story of the relationship between war reporters and technology that has been going on for over 150 years. John, I'm on the major east-west highway here that bisects across the West Bank and leads down to the Jordan Valley. The reporter may look calm and collected on screen, but behind the scenes, reporting live from a conflict zone can be a frantic affair. Beyond the white truck, that is where the suicide bomber detonated his device just a little under two hours ago now. From the first moment when you get that phone call, you have to go, and it's a question of what have you got with you and what do you need to be able to do the job. It's an ordinary day in Jerusalem for CNN's senior international correspondent, Sheila McVicker. Two suicide bombs have exploded, two people are dead, and the pressure is on to file a live report. But they're having problems with a satellite truck. Okay, we ready? You've got people there on the scene trying to talk to you. You've got, you've got producers, camera crew trying to talk to me. We had a problem with the truck. We couldn't get the satellite link established and we're coming down to the point where Atlanta wants to see us. For Sheila's report to be seen around the globe, it must first get to CNN's headquarters in Atlanta. If the satellite won't work, there's no report. They came up, they've gone down, he's freaking. We're exactly setting the line-up. Mike, Mike, Mike! There is a producer in the control room in Atlanta who will say, OK, you're, we're coming to you in a minute and a half or two minutes. OK, they're seeing us, but we are freezing. We're yelling at the truck, you know, come on, come on, come on, what's the problem, what's the problem, is the problem here, is the problem in Atlanta? You speak to the satellites and you tell them that if it goes black, you're going to kick his ass. We sent something. Excuse me? Live, 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 live. Thank you. The drama is that I'm live, I'm there, it's happening now. That's where the energy comes from out of that kind of reporting. Sorry, I'm getting in the shade. <laughs> Sheila McVicker represents the dream that war reporters have aspired to for nearly 200 years. It's live, it's on the spot, and it's on our screens at the flick of a switch. In 1861, things were very different. When the American Civil War began, photography was only 35 years old. Okay, gentlemen, here we go, perfectly still. Things are up now, very proud. Photographers came from far and wide to record the country at war. Okay, you may move. Today, reenactors at Gettysburg, one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, take photographs using the original camera equipment. These were individual private firms that were doing this not only to record history, but for monetary gain. Battlefield photography was fraught with problems. They needed to take a whole wagon load of chemicals, heavy camera equipment, and even their darkrooms with them to war. Everything had to be done on the spot and against the clock before the photographic chemicals dried out. It is okay to breathe and blink, but you can't move at all. Perfectly still. There could be no action shots in this war. Even the tiniest movement blurred the picture. The end result wasn't a photo as we know it today, but a fragile glass plate. Imagine all these fantastic photographs and just how nervous they must have been going over these rocky roads, and it must have been very nerve-wracking getting them back to the studio. Until the Civil War, battlefield photography meant formal portraits of smartly dressed soldiers. One man was to change all that. Matthew Brady, 
became the first photographer to record the true horror of war. People were just horrified by it, yet it was like a bad accident. You couldn't help but watch them. For all their news value, no one had the technology to print these photos in newspapers. Instead, they were displayed in Brady's gallery back home. People were lined up down Matthew Brady's stairs at his Broadway studio in New York City and down to the sidewalk and around the corner. Brady had discovered an essential truth. Images of war, the more shocking the better, sell. These pictures set the tone for war reporting for the next century. In 1898, cameramen from the Vitagraph Company of New York returned from the Spanish-American War with this footage of a naval battle off the coast of the Philippines. It was billed as the first ever action footage of war. Moving pictures had only existed for three years, and these images amazed audiences wherever they were shown. But the film was a fake. The cameramen had found it so difficult to film the action that they reconstructed the battle back in New York. But because film was such an unfamiliar and startling medium, the deceit wasn't exposed until 40 years later, when the cameramen revealed how they really made the film. My partner Albert E. Smith and I will reenact the making of the production for you exactly as it occurred 40 years ago. Pinches of gunpowder set off by lighted punk on the end of a wire produced the effect of the big guns. Grand total for producing the Battle of Manila Bay, $3.55. Moving pictures had become big business by the time the First World War began in 1914. What better way to keep business booming in wartime than to show the audience films from the front? In the picture palaces, it was a silent war. With cameras this big, there was no chance of getting up close to the action. D.W. Griffith, one of the greatest directors of silent movies, was invited by the British to make a propaganda film in the trenches. For Griffith, however, real war was far too boring. After a day or two at the front, he asked the army to supply him with between 20 and 40,000 soldiers for a month, together with six aeroplanes, so he could reconstruct a battle on Salisbury Plain in southern England. It was still easier to fake a war than to film a real one. When his film Hearts of the World was shown, Griffith never revealed the deception. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. In the 1930s, synchronized sound was introduced to films for the first time. By World War II, weekly newsreels accompanied every cinema presentation. And don't you be know much more than you can do. Come on, hold your hand out. We're all fed up with you. By now, the technology had moved on and cameras had been developed that allowed cameramen to get close to the action for the first time. They go into action anywhere and any time, armed only with loaded film. Newsreel cameraman Ted Candy was only 20 and had never been to sea before when he was assigned to the Royal Navy. The clockwork Newman Sinclair camera he was given was small, portable and rugged. When I was younger, it was quite light. I mean, it was about 25 pounds and you used to hold it like that. 
You could always tell a, a cameraman in those days who used a Newman Sinclair because the base of the camera got sharp, sharp edge. And when they used to hold the camera up like that, you used to cut the lapels of the jackets, all score across the chest. John Turner was another of the men with scored lapels. Like Ted, John worked for the newsreel company Gaumont British. And as he hung on to this shot, thought after thought raced through the cameraman's mind. Will it hit us in the meantime? Can I get this safely back to England? He got his picture. All was well. And to John Turner of Gaumont British, it was the shot of a lifetime. In November 1941, John Turner had been filming all day on the battleship HMS Valiant and decided to go and get himself a cup of tea. It's sort of almost my principle never to leave the, uh, the bridge at all during daylight hours. Anyway, I decided I'd take a chance. Well, I just got on my foot on the first ladder when I heard this bang. Three German torpedoes had struck the battleship HMS Barham just a few hundred yards away. I rushed back to the camera and I didn't have a lot of film. I had about 150 feet in the camera which is about a minute and a half. And I thought, oh, I'd better take some shots. And as I started to film, the, the funnels of the barham touched the water and the ship blew up. Just as that happened, the film ran out. I mean, if it, if it had been a few seconds later, I'd have missed it. Absolutely, um, from a filmic point of view, it was wonderful, but of course it was a terrible thing. 861 men were killed in seconds, and the tragedy had been caught on camera. It was the first film of a sinking battleship during World War II. Despite the massive explosion going on just yards away, John Turner's original film was completely silent. Sound cameras did exist, but they were so cumbersome that they were completely useless for action shots in wartime. A soundtrack added later in London was put over the top of the pictures before they were shown to the public. The biggest story in Western Europe today is the attempted assassination of Hitler. This was the real soundtrack of World War II, and it came not from film, but from the radio. They came in masses of landing craft that followed each other so closely in their flotillas that the channel, through the clouds and the rain, looked solid with ships. Radios were in virtually every home and listened to avidly. Now news direct from Western Europe. General Electric takes you to London, Richard C. Hotelet reporting. Radio was more Im important, I think, and certainly made a, f a deeper impression on people than even the biggest headlines in, in the press, because it was person to person. There was a human being who had watched something or had learned something or who had thought of something telling you what it was that was going on, and it was a conversation in a way, a one-way conversation to be sure, but it was a conversation. But radio was about to get much better with the development of a new invention, the wire recorder. It freed reporters from the studio and allowed them to make recordings in the field to be broadcast later. Richard Hotlett was the first reporter ever to use it on a bombing raid. I was not terribly welcome on the plane because we were flying B-26s, the so-called marauders. And they, they carried, of course, a heavy gas load, a heavy bomb load, and it took them forever to take off. And I turned up with the wire recorder and automobile batteries to run it, which were very heavy. And the added weight of all this was not good news for the crew chief, but he, he grinned and bore it. And uh, I talked then on the way to Paris, and we got some flack and all the rest of it, and looked down through the bomb bay and saw the bombs fall on the airport. Halfway there, as usually happened, the wire broke, 
And the technique was to tie a square knot and seal the thing with a burning cigarette, which I then smoked, and uh, seal it and carry on. And uh, it seemed to work. The essentials were remained on the wire, and we came home, and it was the first wire recording. Such was the power of radio that the reporters became huge stars. And in America, no one was bigger than Edward R. Murrow. Hi, Ed. Hi, Van. Hi. All right. Fine. Rough trip? No, not at all. No fighters, no flak, just like a rocking chair. In his determination to let his listeners feel just what it was like to be under an enemy bomb attack, Morrow was prepared to improvise and innovate. He would trail a wire from his studio up to the roof of the BBC's broadcasting house in central London while German bombs fell around him. You can have little understanding of the life in London these days. There are no words to describe the thing that is happening. The courage of the people, the flash and roar of the guns rolling down the streets, the stench of the air raid shelters. In three or four hours, people must get up and go to work, just as though they had a full night's rest, free from the rumble of guns and the wonder that comes when they wake and listen in the dead hours of the night. Murrow, of course, with his reporting in the first years of the war from London, uh, conveyed to the United States the steadfastness of the British people and the determination of the, of the British government to see it through and carried the message really that this was an ally worth helping and that must have been of enormous importance. This is it. They're on the beach. But while Murrow and Hotlet were using the very latest technology to bring news from the front, other reporters were expected to use something more old-fashioned to get their stories back home. I ran into my dear friend Charlie Lynch of Reuters, and it turned out that Reuters had uh, equipped their D-Day correspondents with pigeons. <laughs> they, they had to go into combat wading through the water against the fire of the Germans, carrying a bunch of pigeons. He's behind a burning tank <laughs> and writing his dispatch that he has great trouble folding, and getting into the capsule and onto the darn pigeon's ankle, and says to it, indeed, <laughs> uh, I don't know what he's instructed to say, but he did and say, London, London, you know, pushed the pigeon into the air. The pigeon went up and made a wonderful circle of the battlefield and Charlie, and then flew straight toward Berlin. <laughs> But not all pigeons had such treacherous instincts. Mrs. Alexander, wife of the First Lord of the Admiralty, hears the exploits of Gustav and Paddy, two D-Day carrier pigeons, decorated with the Medal for Gallantry. Mm. Paddy has much pleasure decorating you with the Well, well, what do you know? <laughs> The 1950s, and a revolution that would change the lives of every family on the home front. Television had arrived. By 1960, 100 million people around the globe owned a television. So when America went to war in Vietnam, television cameras were there too, and television brought war into the living room. was real, the sound was real, and the film could be flown home and be on the air in as little as 48 hours. Get over there, come on! Cameramen and reporters travelled right to the heart of the action. These guns are firing now about 15, 20 miles up the road towards the Cambodian border. Vietnam was an astonishing one. Wherever you wanted to go, there was a helicopter to take you there. If you wanted to go up to Da Nang, wanted to go up to Wei, wanted to go to Ku Chi, uh, wherever, there was a helicopter to take you and bring you back. Michael Nicholson, use it. 
news at 10 on the road to Tay Ninh in South Vietnam. You could literally call up a company commander, say a captain or, or a major, and say, I, you know, anything planned, anything interesting. Sure, come on up, come on down. And, um, and you would, and you'd turn up that evening or the next morning early, and you'd go out on an operation that might produce nothing. Uh, or indeed, uh, would produce something that you maybe wish you hadn't turned up for. We're on the outskirts of the village of Cam Ni with elements of the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. And we were walking into this village when you can hear what happened. For viewers whose sons, fathers, and brothers were risking their lives in Southeast Asia, the new technology of television allowed them to see events of the war in a new light. This 1965 report is credited with profoundly changing American public opinion. This is what the war in Vietnam is all about. The old and the very young. The Marines have burned this old couple's cottage because fire was coming from here. Come this way. It was unfeeling and it was brutal. Uh, and they immediately made this community of, of people scratching a living out of rice paddies uh, into refugees. The women and the old men who remained will never forget that August afternoon. Morley Safer's report took only two days to get on the air. It shattered viewers' perceptions of the war and was to help trigger the anti-war movement in America. This was a very, very naive time in a certain way. I don't think anyone on the ground felt any qualms about doing whatever they're doing in front of the cameras. In those days, you were connected with this umbilical cord to the sound recordist. So wherever the cameraman went, the sound man had to be with him, otherwise the cable snapped. You couldn't run anywhere like, like today. When television went to war in the 60s, satellite communications barely existed. Reporters had to rely on their wits to get their film on the next plane home. We physically had to get it out of the country. We would have to rely upon what we called pigeons. You'd go to the airport and you'd see people queuing up at the check-in desk, going to London or going wherever, and you'd actually say to somebody, excuse me, Mike Nicholson, ITN, uh, news at 10, uh, we've got this film, uh, we've just been covering a bit of war here, or we've just covering this disaster. Would you mind carrying this to London for us? During the Vietnam War, broadcasts began to be shown in colour. From now on, the blood was red, the images even more powerful. Television had become such a force that viewers turned to its news presenters as figures of authority. And in America, no one was more authoritative than CBS anchor Walter Cronkite. Tonight, report from Vietnam by Walter Cronkite. If the communist intention was to take and seize the cities, they came closer here at Way than anywhere else. And now, three weeks after the offensive began, the firing still goes on from here on the new side of the city and across the Perfume River to the old side, the Citadel. When Cronkite visited Vietnam in 1968, he was so appalled by what he saw that it was agreed that he would write a personal editorial to go at the end of his report when he got back home. It was a tough fight. For every means we have to escalate, the enemy can match us. And that applies to invasion of the North, the use of nuclear weapons, or the mere commitment of 100 or 200 or 300,000 more American troops to the battle. And with each escalation, the world comes closer to the brink of cosmic disaster. It turned out that uh, President Johnson had been watching that broadcast. He watched all the three network evening broadcasts, I gather, and he said, flipping the set off with some anger, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America. Eastern world, it 
is exploding, violence flaring, bullets loading. You're old enough to kill, but not for voting. You don't believe in... By the time the last American soldier left Saigon in 1975, governments on both sides of the Atlantic had realized that television was a genie that could not be put back in the bottle. Coverage of the Vietnam War would leave a damaging legacy for reporters trying to cover wars in the future. In 1962, the first live television pictures between Britain and America were transmitted by the Telstar satellite. Something's different there. It looks like a face. It's a face. By the late 1970s, satellite broadcasting was well underway. The satellite age had begun. At dawn this morning, in the southwestern Atlantic, Argentine forces were landing. From the task force of around 12 large warships, we've colored them white on our model, which had sailed days earlier. So why did coverage of the Falklands War in 1982 look like this? So in the next couple of days, we could move this <coughs> nuclear submarine right up here, and you really... This was all British television had to show. For 54 of the 74 days the conflict lasted, there were no pictures from the war zone. Instead, news from the South Atlantic was announced from outside Downing Street. The commander of the operation has sent the following message. Be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next, what's Mr. Mr. Knott? Thank you very much. What's your reaction, Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to night, declare war on Argentina, Mr. Thatcher? Rejoice. While the Navy did have a satellite dish for their communications, just 21 years ago, none of the reporters had the means to send their stories back home by satellite. When he reported from Vietnam, Michael Nicholson's stories had reached London in just two days. Now his film took 22 days to get back home. There was no way for us to get out the film other than giving it to a ship that was going north and some of them were slow-going ships. And when it got to Ascension Isles, then it was transmitted by satellite to London. While the pictures took the slow route home, the reporter's voice was recorded separately by phone on a nearby supply ship, which they had to fly to by military helicopter, when one was made available. I do remember the chief petty officer who was in charge of, of, of logistics on, the, on HMS Hermes, when we complained, saying, we have a limited number of helicopters. I have a priority list. And you bastards are at the bottom of it. Gentlemen, I've just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. Well, that's how we heard the news at 5 to 4 on Monday, June the 14th, from an officer of the Gurkha Rifles, after what he'd heard over his radio, from his own men overlooking Stanley. They're telling him that a white flag is flying over that town. Is this, then, the end to the war? The technology existed to make the Falklands the first ever live war. In fact, because of its location, and a very different attitude to war reporters, it had the dubious distinction of being the war with the greatest delay in modern times between events occurring and the pictures being seen back home. The policy to limit the access for the war reporters in the Falklands had worked so well from the British government's point of view that the Allies decided to employ the same tactics when they went to war in the Gulf in 1991. But one man had the technology to outwit the whole Allied command. It wasn't quite what the manufacturers intended, but this little camera was to play an important role in the reporting of Operation Desert Storm. Captain Vaughan Smith had retired from the Grenadier Guards in 1988, 
and now he was ready to put his military training to use on a different kind of mission. I felt that because the war was being so strictly controlled, because it was hardly a war of national survival, I thought it was fair to be a little devious. I therefore uh, dressed up as a British Army officer, I forged identity documents. Posing as an officer, Vaughan Smith infiltrated a British Army unit as they drove to Saudi Arabia. I jumped in the vehicle and said, all right, we're full, let's go, because I was pretending to be an officer. And so I think that is the extent to which I disrupted the war effort. I was able to make my way to the front with the British lifeguards who were in tanks and they were on the move to the front and I got in with them. I then swapped unit and moved from different unit to different unit every 24 hours, which was problematic because you get supplied in the army according to the unit you're with. You can't just drive around the desert and hope to get fed. Um, so I didn't get fed, I lost an awful lot of weight. Vaughan Smith's disguise was so convincing, he was accepted by the officers and their men. What's happening here now, sir, is the gyros are realigning. Are you filming now? Yep. It's the voice of the uh, tape. I nearly got caught several times. Uh, the closest was I was attending the briefing before the actual conflict um, started. Radio silence throughout. The reason behind that is we are trying to disguise the fact the Brits are in this area. And at the end they said, oh yes, and look out, there's a journalist called Smith wandering around the battlefield impersonating a British Army officer. Well, they were completely right, and he was actually sitting there. <laughs> and I felt a, a little concerned then, and that's when I decided I should move to the Americans, because it was getting a bit hot with the Brits. With his new American hosts, Vaughan now got right to the front line. Two people could sit up on top of the Bradley armoured fighting vehicle, so I was able to take one of them when it wasn't being used and film pretty well anything I liked. With his home video gear, charm and daring, amazingly, Vaughan Smith managed to film undetected throughout the entire six weeks of Operation Desert Storm. You're unbelievable. When he returned home, his unique footage was in demand from broadcasters around the world. The BBC has obtained exclusive new pictures giving a soldier's eye view of the modern high-tech weapons which changed the course of the conflict. Broadcasters were so keen to show Vaughan's pictures because his was the only footage of the ground attack shot by a journalist during the whole operation. The missiles came at daybreak. These were the live action shots we did see during Gulf War I. We think they're only using conventional warheads, not chemical, but it's too early to say. We're waiting for the state radio to give us some instructions to take off this equipment. But thrilling and dangerous as they looked, in reality, these reporters were merely broadcasting from their hotel rooftops or their offices. I must say that this is the the darnest way to con conduct an interview. Things should have been very different. CNN alone is estimated to have spent $25 million on their war coverage and were broadcasting 24 hours a day. Reporters from all the networks had a new box of tricks, portable satellites they could fit in the back of a truck. In theory, at least, reports could be filed live from almost anywhere, anytime. At the time, it was really sexy. It was really something to be able to say, I am standing in the desert of southern Iraq and talking to you live. Of course, these days, it's nothing. Cutting edge just 12 years ago, these early portable satellites were awkward and unpredictable. It was like a Heath Robinson contraption. You had to put up this umbrella satellite dish and, and point it at the, find the satellite in the sky and wait for it to lock on. And Oh, it was a mission. It was quite unwieldy. We, it was two truckloads of us, as it were. It took a bit of time to set up. You couldn't instantly do it. Uh, it took a good hour and a half. We did have these concerns that, that because the satellite signal itself is a sort of a, a, a radio wave signal, did that mean that uh, a missile attached to an aircraft or an aircraft might perceive us as a hostile radar installation? It was the spring and there were flies and bugs in the air. It was hot, and the only way to 
not get bitten was to wrap one of those Arabic scarves, that, those checked scarves around your face. Suddenly this huge American vehicle, a Humvee vehicle, screeched to a halt and six guys with M16s jumped out and surrounded me. <laughs> and their commander got on the radio and said, uh, uh, we've got an Arab setting up, a, setting, up a setting up a communications facility on the side of the road, what do we do? In the portable satellite age, Gulf War I should have been a television spectacular. But the coalition kept the pool reporters stationed with the troops so far from the action that they had very little to report. It was more dramatic for those in Baghdad. New night vision cameras allowed television reporters to film the action even after dark. They looked live, but even these pictures took up to three days before they were broadcast. Saddam Hussein had let the reporters into his capital on one condition, that they leave their satellite equipment behind at the border. The Iraqis controlled the broadcasting, so you could never send any material out without their say-so, unless you put, it in a, put the tape physically in a car and sent it to the border. That meant they all relied on Iraqi television's communication tower. And when the feed line used by the journalists was bombed on the first night of the war, they were facing the prospect of a news blackout from Baghdad. One broadcaster, CNN, did stay on the air and made history and its reputation by continuing to broadcast live as the war began. We're going back to the wire that we have to Baghdad. John Holloman is there, Bernard Shaw is there, Peter Arnett and CNN staffers. The bombing is intensifying now. There's a plane nearby. Bernie, you can see something? Right, it's broken out on either side of us here at the hotel. And I'm just going to be quiet and let you listen. We knew we had the number one story in the world. Uh, there was quiet relish for a few minutes. I remember Peter Arnett, our, Holloman and I embracing one another and saying, we've got the number one story. CNN got their scoop by using a piece of technology that had been around for years. Before the war started, they set up an office communication system called a four-wire that linked them to their offices outside the country via a dedicated phone line. We got the Iraqi government permission to do that. What we did not tell them was that we would actually use this four-wire for broadcast purposes. When the war began, they disabled all the international phone lines so that nobody could make calls from the hotel or from anywhere else in Baghdad. But of course, this circuit bypassed all the telephone exchanges. It was a dedicated circuit. CNN put their four-wire to good use by hooking it up to their broadcast system in Atlanta so they could hear their reporters live on the phone line. Go ahead, Bernie. I'm just crouching down here on the floor. But their scoop was no breakthrough on the technological front. It was something which Edward Murrow would have recognized from World War II. It was really just radio. It was like the fireworks finale on the 4th of July at the base of the Washington Monument. Peter, you're chuckling, but that to me is not an exaggeration. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, yet our purpose is sure. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. By the time Gulf War II began, finally reporters had the access, and what's more, they had the technology. Just after 8 o'clock in the morning here in the port at Umm Qasar, and a huge firefight has begun between the American Marines here and presumably... This time, journalists and military were working together. A new term entered the dictionary when the Pentagon and the British Ministry of Defence offered more than 700 reporters the chance to be embedded with the coalition troops. They can't communicate with these people, but they can make gestures. And everyone seems to be beckoning them forward. And video phones could feed back their distinctive live reports from the far corners of the war zone. This is going to be a big bang. Others broadcast live pictures 24 hours a day from the epicenter of the war, 
This time, they were leaving nothing to chance. I think we spent probably the better part of about seven months uh, planning what technology to bring into Baghdad. And it took that much thought uh, to get it in because Iraq, under the uh, Saddam Hussein regime, was a highly controlled society. So what we had to do was, well, obviously we needed all this equipment, was um, how to bring it in. And in, we smuggled it in, basically. In Baghdad, the reporters stood on their hotel balconies night and day to supply the constant demands of 24-hour rolling news. You literally every night just went out onto the balcony and you saw 25 years of Saddam's Iraq disappear in front of your eyes. When journalists talk about a front row seat in history, that is literally what we had. From the balcony, we saw a unique historical era blown to bits. During Gulf War II, the technology of war reporting had come so far that showing death as it happened was now a real possibility. John Simpson and his producer Tom Giles were traveling with a Kurdish unit and some American special forces in the north of Iraq. We are advancing. Uh, we've gone well over the ridge. But we're, the, we're the big convoy of serious looking general types. And there's air support firing around over our heads. It all looks quite promising. I jumped out of the car. My colleagues had already jumped out of their car, including the cameraman, uh, who shouted at me, saying, basically, get the tripod. I remember I was just going to do that when my phone rang. I had this portable satellite phone. And, you know, it was my mother. My mother saying, happy birthday. And I was slightly stunned, but also excited anyway about what was going on. And then there was a very loud bang. The convoy had been hit by an American missile. What followed next was a picture of war the American military would never have anticipated. The planes were so low they had seen the missile as it came down. I saw it, a white body, red I fucking nose. I saw, I saw the same thing, black, it came down black, and then I, Jesus, I can't believe it. Cameron and I were about 10 yards away from where the missile hit us. If it had been a bomb, we'd have been dead. Um, and uh, the man standing beside me, our translator, was, uh, got a, uh, an injury that he died of within minutes. <laughs> What started happening was all the ammunition in these Kurdish vehicles and American vehicles just started blowing up. So every time you looked up to get a sense of what was happening, these things just whizzed past you. Oh, fuck. Have you called your friends off? Excuse me. Hi. The biggest fear for the team was that another attack would follow. Tom Giles used his satellite phone to contact an American commander he had interviewed the day before, begging him to call off the planes. And then I handed the phone to John. This is just a scene from hell here, all the vehicles on fire. Within 10 minutes, John Simpson was broadcasting live by sat phone. Bodies on the ground. Um, this was a really bad own goal by the Americans. With his interpreter lying fatally wounded nearby, the reality of the new technology meant John Simpson was still under pressure to file another report. The cameraman said, OK, we can now do a piece to camera. So the, the, the cars are still burning behind us. There's still rockets and bullets in them are still exploding and coming around. It's very dangerous. Um, most of the people who died died in that period. And um, I then have to think of something that I'm going to say which is coherent and doesn't look crazed, lunatic, uh, savage, uh, whatever. And I don't have any time to think about it. This is a disaster that should never have happened. I've just been speaking to the American Special Forces officer who actually called in this airstrike without realizing, of course, that it was going to hit him, his men, us. 
and our colleagues here. This is just one of those things that happens in war, I suppose. News has got so used to your ability to broadcast images from a war zone almost immediately that there isn't any time to really stop and think and dwell on the sort of things you're seeing which I think to any other person, any person in any other walk of life would, would seriously affect you and seriously upset you. John Simpson's BBC crew were doing what 19th century reporters and photographers could only dream about. Wars unfold 24 hours a day in real time on our screens. But are we really any closer to the full picture of what's happening at the front? I don't think any of this technology makes you a better journalist or even it to some extent enhances your ability to get the truth across to the public because it's quite easy to be so preoccupied with what's happening now this minute that you lose the you know, the context within which this minute is happening it's postcards home no more than that it's like somebody arriving in your living room and saying i've just been away um, for several months and i've got the photographs and instead of producing just a packet, they produce um, five suitcases and they empty them out over the living room floor. And you say, um, what exactly did you do? You can pick up a newspaper, a magazine, and read and edit a story, see nicely cropped pictures and what have you. But in live television news coverage of a story around the clock, you get what unfolds and sometimes uh, news can be very messy. There's sometimes no, no time even for sober second thought. I can't remember who it was that f first said that journalism is the first draft of history. Well, let me tell you, I'm the scribbled notebook of journalism. That's what this is. This is fast, it's live, and you really hope it's right. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live.